Dr. Boyd Murray, the director of Murray Wireless. Welcome, Mr. Murray. Well, it looks like my job is to wake everybody up. Is that right? <laughs> After lunch? Okay. Um, so, how's everybody enjoying it so far? Good, you're learning new stuff? Yeah. Okay, um, this, uh, I'm going to talk on, uh, this is an LPN workshop, and I don't actually really know what the difference between a talk and a workshop is, but I guess this is kind of like becoming just a little bit more practical. So, uh, uh, and uh, well, yeah, LP WANs has already been covered partially by Dr. Dean Economou this morning from Telstra and also from uh, Renald Gallus from uh, Thinkstra slash Sigfox. But I'm going to give you a, like a bit of a, a bigger picture of LP WAN and a bigger picture of some of the options because obviously Telstra's got its own interests to look after and, uh, and uh, so does uh, Thinkstra and Sigfox. So this is kind of more of an independent overview of it. Uh, so this is what we're going to do. We're going, I'm going to give you some background information, talk about what IoT and LP WAN are, and just a quick show of hands, is, does everybody know what IoT is? Does anybody not know what IoT is? Okay, somebody there. Um, does everybody know what LP WAN is, or are there quite a few people here who don't know what LP WAN is? Okay, there's some shaking heads. So, so some, for some people, this is a totally new concept, which is, that's quite okay by me. Um, okay, so I'll just start off quick abstract. Um, the IoT, Internet of Things, is the next really big thing to hit the world as far as telecommunications goes. And uh, I'd kind of compare it to when uh, mobile phones first started coming out, you know. So how many people had a mobile phone in their pocket back in 1980? They were around, by the way. Okay. How many people don't have a mobile phone in their pocket now? Right. <laughs> that shows you where mobile phones have gone over the last you know, 30 years, or actually 30, 36 years. The same thing is going to be happening, but this, in this case, for IoT, is going to be happening for machines or devices or things. Right? It's called the Internet of Things. So it's, it's things talking to things. And uh, the, the really big thing that's happening, um, I mean, there's been machines talking to machines, M2M, all of these kind of things have been around for quite a long time. What's different now? Well, there's something new coming on the market and that is LP WANs, Low Power Wide Area Networks. And this is going to be the big, this is going to cause a big explosion in the usage case. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an overview of me, just to give me a little bit of credibility. Uh, did my first uh, wireless transmitter when I was eight years old, uh, and I had more hair back then too. You know, so, um, since then I've um, got myself three degrees. Last one was a PhD in telecoms, and I worked for some pretty big na big name companies, AWA, Plessy. Spent 12 years at CSIRO, some of the time with Dean Economy from. Uh, Telstra this morning, and uh, since then I've done two startup companies. Uh, one was in in the VoIP industry, and the the one I'm in now is uh, Murray Wireless, doing consulting and design and deployment of wireless technologies. We also have two patents, two wireless patents up there, which you can search on the on the net. And uh, yeah, actually, whilst I was at CSIRO, I was the eight years. I was the rep to the 802.11 Wi-Fi group, so I was the CSIRO Wi-Fi guy for eight years. So, what do you already know about IoT? What do you need to know about IoT? Or don't you know what you don't know about IoT? So. Um, I've kind of already asked that question, so I won't go any further with it. So let's just do a little bit of a brief background, a brief history of time, or actually, no, a brief, brief history of uh, wireless internet IoT. And uh, I guess the first thing to say is the Greeks started noticing that uh, if you rubbed ambergris back in 600 BC, that fluff got attached to it. Now, who would have believed that that's how we got the wireless industry? But actually, the questioning over why that happened because there was no wire connecting the fluff to the ambergris. It just came to it by itself. It was a magical force, electrostatic force. So that was the first 
official wireless, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, then uh, 1895, there's a guy called uh, Marconi who did uh, uh, radio telegraph, but uh, who thinks that Marconi invented wireless? No, he didn't. No, he, all he did was he just took everybody else's inventions and put them into a box and patented it. And, but he's the one who became famous. Um, skipping through some of those. First mobile phone, 1958. Right? Um, that surprised me, actually. Uh, 1G, phone, 1979. First wireless IoT connection. Recorded, anyway, in 1982. Was a Coke machine. Um, and basically, you sent a text, some kind, or some kind of text message to a uh, to your to some service. I'm not quite sure to some number, and the Coke and the Coke machine delivered the Coke, and you got charged the Coke, the value of the Coke on your phone bill. Right. So that was pretty early. World Wide Web um, kind of emerged around about 1990. Um, Wi-Fi, 1997, and um, 4G Mobile, 2008. That's eight years ago. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked by that because it only just seems like yesterday. Anyway, that's a little bit of a brief overview. So let's talk about some of these uh, acronyms up here. PANS, BANS, LANS, WLANS, etc., 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 WANS, WANS, LP WANS. Low power wide area network. Right, that's the one we're going to talk about today. But I'll give you a bit of context about what each of these are because a lot of this is, is uh, horses for courses. And in some cases where people think everything should be done by LP WANs, actually it can be done by existing WLANs, wireless LANs, Wi Fi, if, if, the, if the usage scenario is correct, is, is, is appropriate. So here's a nice little graphic of. Um, where you use each of these different types of net networks. AN normally, stand, AN normally stands for area network. So we're talking about PAN. Oh, sorry. PAN is a body area network. Oh, ba sorry, BAN is a body area network. So obviously that covers the body. And you'll see sensors connecting into little collection points on, on bodies or even nearby um, Bluetooth receivers, um, but actually the Bluetooth receivers are actually on the body normally as well. Um, so PANS, personal area network is basically just a cord replacement. So you'll have, for example, your uh, Bluetooth mouse is a PAN, right? Um, so that's a range of about 10 metres. Then we go up to LANs, local area networks. So everybody kind of knows, you know, their computer is hooked into an Ethernet cable at work. And that, that's actually a LAN, it's a local area network, right? And then back in about 1997 to 2000, LANs were starting to be replaced by WLANs, wireless LANs, where you didn't have to plug that blue cable into the side of your computer. So that's WLANs, talking about maybe covering a house, right? And maybe if it's line of sight going up to about 100 metres, maybe. Then the metropolitan area network, most people don't really talk about that very much, but that's like a big tower in the middle of a city covering the whole city, right? So it's, uh, there's a, yeah, there's a tech net technology called 802.16 or WiMAX, which does this kind of thing. Um, it's not v extremely strongly ad adopted. And probably the one that most people are most familiar with is a a WAN, a wide area network. So that's what your mobile phones are uh, hooked onto. And their um, wide area means it could be like uh, a city or it could be a state or it could be entire country or it could be entire region. Um, so y W stands for wide, right? So we're talking about LP WANs, which are low power wide area networks. So we're talking about something that uh, is similar to the mobile phone network, except that it's low power. And Renald, in his uh, Thinkstra Sigfox presentation, actually explained the reasons why low power is important, and I'll, I'll recover some of that a little bit. But looking at some of the uh, LP WAN technologies, 
Um, here they are up here. Sigfox, which is Thinkstra is doing in Australia. LoRaWAN, which is uh, kind of like an open source kind of thing. Newell, Engine U, and um, yeah, and that, so these are the kind of like the proprietary ones over here. And over on this side here are the ones that are linked into 3GPP, which is who, who does all the mobile phone networks, the cellular networks. So we, you've kind of already you're kind of splitting into two halves, proprietary and, you know, like highly standardised, well-known standards over here. And it's funny because I've got LoRaWAN here, kind of like halfway, LoRaWAN, Newell and Engineer halfway between uh, being a man and being a WAN, and that's because they can be operated standalone. In fact, it seems like LoRaWAN is not really being implemented as a wide area network. It's actually being implemented more like a metropolitan area network or very localised, like a council area or something like that, or maybe just a cluster in a small area. But it can be operated as a WAN as well. Okay. Um, so now we're just going to, I'm just going to drill into this a little bit. So this talk's a little bit more technical. There's a lot of detail here, but we've only got about one hour, so I'm going to really, if, I'm apologies if I skip through some of these slides because there's just not enough time to do it in detail, but I'll make the slides available if you come up to me and talk to me and uh, give me your cards or whatever, and I'll, I'll shoot you a link to the slides. So I'm going to talk about uh, overview of IoT and LP WAN applications and the killer app, which is LP WAN. Okay, so IoT, Internet of Things, surprisingly, only coined back in 1999, less than 20 years ago. Um, you also hear acronyms like machine to machine and things like that. So some of this stuff, even though it seems to be new, is not actually new. It's just been rebadged. <coughs> um, classical Internet, which we all use, connects people to information servers, but the IoT connects things objects, devices, to other things, like you know, servers or whatever, and then somehow they can be used by human beings or sometimes they are just autonomous within themselves. Like buildings, like uh, buildings, you know, control systems within buildings might not ever actually talk to a person. Or um, uh, autonomous cars or things like that. Um, so, the things are embedded, embedded with electronics, software, sensors, uh, and the network con con connectivity is mainly wireless, but sometimes it can be wired as well. But um, so the, yeah, the real killer app is the network connectivity. Uh, I'm not going to go through applications because that's been covered by you know, numerous other speakers and probably will be, so I don't need to repeat that. But you all know all those kind of things. Okay, so this is the killer app, LP WAN. And this was already covered by some nice graphics on uh, Renault's presentation from Thinkstra this morning. Um, low power, these, these are the big, big things. And I think low power, low power, which is equivalent to battery, long battery life, is a really big one because it enables sensors to be uh, deployed in places where they couldn't be deployed before economically, before. Um, mainly because you'd have to go keep going around and replacing the battery every week or something like that, and that made it uneconomic. Um, so low power, uh, long battery life, low data rates, that's what actually makes it low power, the low data rates, for reasons of physics, which I won't go into here. Um, Low, low bandwidths, they're related to the low data rates, and that's why it makes it low power. Uh, small size, um, that's related to modern electronics and as well as the frequencies that are being used. Um, easy deployment, because some of these devices are only kind of like, you know, this big. You could put a bit of sticky tape on the back of them, put them up on a wall, and they, some of them could have 10-year battery lives. It's fantastic, you know? This has only become realisable, really, with uh, the advent of um, LP WANs. Uh, okay, and probably the thing where I can see it's going to be used most is just our um, smart metering, things like that. 
Okay. So now, this is the thing that you haven't got in the in the previous presentations: is how, where do all of these things fit in together? Right? There's all of these buzzwords around. You know, like a Sigfox, uh, LoRaWAN. Uh, there's a NBIAT, 3G, all this, oh, 4G, all this kind of stuff. I'm going to give you an overview of where they all fit together. Okay, so, right. First off, there's uh, non LP WAN, right? And I'm just in including that for a completeness because there's been a lot of IoT around that a, there is, there has been, and there is a lot of IoT around that doesn't actually need an LP WAN. For example, if uh, home automation is IoT, right? so the home automation buzzword has been around for probably at least coming up to 10 years, been using Wi Fi, right? And there's no reason why it shouldn't because most of the devices which are hooking on can be powered from the power in the home and they've already got a wireless network in there anyway, right, which is the Wi-Fi. So you don't need to have low power. Um, so they're not, they, they've been around for a while, so I'm not going to cover them very much, but I'll, I'll skip over those slides when we get to them. Then there's another category which I showed in that previous slide, which is proprietary LP WAN, and these are technologies which have been coming out over the last five to seven years and we actually, in Australia, we actually have uh, one supplier who was probably the first company in the world to start using LP WANs, and that's a company called Taggle, of which we have a representative somewhere in the audience. Mark Halliwell's just over there somewhere. I don't know. He was here a minute ago. Um, very, yeah. Oh, there he is. There he is, yeah. Um, so that was a very uh, kind of brave move seven years ago, and it looks like it might be coming off for them. That's good, good for that, good for Australia. And the thing with those guys, with the LP WAN guys, and that includes uh, Sigfox and Thinkstra, that we were, um, well, Thinkstra is the Australian franchisee of Sigfox, is they got in before the cellular industry. So they're operating on the first to market uh, model, okay? And then now the cellular guys, uh, for one reason or another, are catching up with that. And who knows, they may end up just overtaking it all. I, I don't, can't predict the future, but they could. Not sure. We'll talk about that later on. Um, the interesting thing about the cellular guys is, is that they already have huge rollout of, um, of base station infrastructure out there. And it turns out that for 4G base stations, you can add in the LP WAN capability uh, just by doing software upgrades to the base stations. Now, can you imagine that? You do software upgrades over a period of two or three weeks, and you've got an entire LP WAN network over the entire country. So that could be a business case. But the question is, when is that going to happen? Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into the non-LP WANs. We, we don't have enough time for that. But if you do want to go back through the slide presentation, come and see me and um, I'll shoot you a link to it. I'll just do one of the slides from the uh, non-LP WAN, and that's cellular 2G, 3G, 4G. And the reason I want to do this one is because I want to show you what a... Uh, I think this is a 3G one. That's oh, a 2G one. This is a 2G water meter data logger sitting out at Macquarie University, right? And that basically had to have the battery replaced every three months, but it was... And, and that's only five years old, right? So, yeah. Sorry? That's, I don't, that's not operated, well, I tell, yeah, sorry, Telstra is phasing out 2G, you're correct. Right, so this will become obsolete very soon. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about the proprietary LP WANs, and there's quite a few of them, and some of these may not even be ex, um, excellent anymore. Um, Sigfox is a big one, uh, LoRaWAN, Taggle, Newell, OnRamp, which then got rene renamed to Engineu, 
And there could even be other ones out there that I don't know about. Uh, so there's a lot of information on this slide which I won't go into too much detail, but uh, uh, Sigfox has been around, uh, started off in France around about in 2009. And uh, they've rolled out all around uh, Europe and they're doing Australia and New Zealand right now. Um, I talk to those guys, to Ronald and the other guys at uh, Thinkstra quite often. And, um, you know, um, they're doing quite well. The data rates are quite, quite low, about 10 to 1,000 bits per second. That's not megabits per second, that's a bits per second. And that just reminds me that this highlights the difference between what's been happening in, in the cellular industry up until now and what's happening with LP WAN networks is that every generation of cellular has been going up in data, data rates, you know, and everybody wants to show you their new phone that's got like 10 megabits per second or whatever. LP WANs are going the other way so they can service uh, devices which don't need those kind of data rates. Uh, Renald gave an example of an open, a, a door closure or an opening, right? You don't need 100 megabits per second to register a door closing or opening. You just need a couple of bytes shot up into the network. And uh, so that's where the LP WAN really comes in. It's actually servicing a particular usage case. Um, so, so, so Sigfox is saying that they're going to complete a large percentage, like 90% or something like that, of Australia and New Zealand population by around about 2017. So the next one, uh, proprietary one, is LoRaWAN, and that's controlled by something called the LoRaWAN Alliance. Actually, one thing I should mention about Sigfox before I go any further is, is that it's primarily what they call an uplink service. In other words, it's, it's loading data up into the network. It's not, it, the only time it accepts data down from the network is straight after an uplink packet. So if you schedule, um, you know, like uh, one, one logging, one reading per day of a water meter or something like that, the only time that the only chance that you've got of sending data back down into that device is straight after it uplinks that data. But of course, if you schedule more uplinks, you're going to drain the battery quicker. So <coughs> that's very important, and I've talked to um, Thinkster about that, and they say, well, they're, they're not trying to target the entire IoT market; they're just trying to target a particular segment that that, that needs the uplink service, and they're saying that's a significant portion of the market. But then we go on to LoRaWAN, and uh, it's, it actually has three different modes. Um, it has three different modes. One of them is just the uplink mode, like, like uh, Sigfox. But then uh, it also has downlink modes as well, right? Um, so, and that, so basically, that's where I've set up here on this, on this slide. It's got asynchronous downlink. And that's important for people who want to have control applications. So uh, not only do they want to monitor the state of, you know, how much water's going through a pipe or something like that, they actually want to be able to turn, turn a valve on or off or something like that, and they want to be able to do it asynchronously. So that's important in a lot of applications. So there may be applications where Sigfox is not appropriate, but LoRaWAN would be appropriate. And I've, some of the clients for my company have told me uh, we don't want to use this particular LP WAN, but we do want to use this particular LP WAN. I ask them why, and they say because of this, this, or this. So it's very much uh, usage related, you know, the, the usage scenario they're talking about. Um, LoRaWAN is uh, actually being rolled out as uh, wide, like countrywide in some countries. Like Korea announced that they're, that they're um, South Korea announced that they're. Um, rolling out an entire country full of LoRaWAN, which surprised me. And I thought, why are they doing that? Because the cellular networks are coming out and introducing another one, or actually already are in some place. So I don't know what the internal machinations in these um, big telcos are, but some of them are not choosing the 3GPP, the cellular technology. They're actually choosing LoRaWAN. <coughs> so that's been rolled out in Europe, Africa, South Korea, and Australia, and um, 
there's some very strange things happening in Australia. There's a, a company called Meshed, which is doing, done like quite a few, there's down in Wollongong, and there's about four or five in Sydney now, the UTS. Um, James Cook University just got one only a few weeks ago. Barangaroo got, got one only just like a week or two ago. Well, no, probably a month or two ago now. And uh, there seems to be little spots coming up with LoRaWAN around the place. Um, and then there's another company called NNNCO. Is anybody from NNNCO here? No? It's a play on NBNCO. NBNCO is National Broadband Network. NNNCO is National Narrowband Network. Right. And they just announced only just recently um, some big collaboration with Ergon Energy up in Townsville, which kind of shocked everybody because we didn't hear anything about them for a long time. Um, so they are, they're doing some good... And also, they've just partnered with Cisco. Right. So there's things happening with LoRaWAN that we didn't expect. Um, now, I'll talk about Taggle. Um, we've got, like I say, we've got, I think we've got two reps from Taggle here. <coughs> um, started back in 2007, um, 2010 first deployment to the water industry and uh, I, I haven't been able to get access to any of these, uh, the technical specifications or the wireless specifications. But uh, they've actually got, uh, one of the Taggle guys sent me an email recently saying, uh, um, to give you some ideas of our progress, we now count 21 water utilities amongst our customers collecting data from greater than 100,000 devices, water meters, sewer, meet, sewer rain gauges, pressure sensors, covering 100,000 square kilometers. And they're also dealing with Mackay Regional Council. <coughs> so, so they're doing some serious business. Uh, there are various other companies around. I won't go into too much detail, but uh, there's a company called Newell, which has got their own standard. And uh, they were just acquired by Huawei back in uh, September 2014. But this all becomes very confusing because Huawei um, supplies equipment to Optus, and Optus is going to be doing, I think, is going to be doing uh, 4G cellular narrowband IoT. So. Even the cellular operators haven't quite figured out what they're really going to do just yet. Another one called Anginu, which then rebadged it to OnRamp, and uh, they found it back in 2009. Similar to Taggle, they kind of saw the uh, LP WAN opportunity coming up, <coughs> and they um, they say a battery life of 20 years, so that's pretty significant. Of course, it all depends on how you use your the nodes little devices. And um, they say they've got 38 networks deployed uh, worldwide and through my various contacts I'm hearing rumours that they're looking at deploying in Australia. So that may or may not happen. Lots of rumours around in this industry. So that was the proprietary ones. Now I'll go on to cellular. And this is where it gets really confusing because there's like about 10 different names for the same thing in the, in the cellular industry. So I've tried to kind of summarise uh, when you see these different things, oh, actually, this is all the same thing, you know, kind of. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of like uh, what's... That, that, that grouping of n names there is what's happening in cellular. <coughs> but, uh, so... There's something called LTE MTC. MTC stands for Machine Type Communications. And that's offering a service of 2 megabits per second in a 1.4 megahertz bandwidth. And uh, so the idea is that that's fairly sim serious telemetry. So I, I'd even have my doubts about whether that would um, be battery powerable. powerable. You know, that might be something where you just have some kind of device where you've got power nearby, plug it in, and you've got kind of reasonably good um, data rates on it. Um, but again, this is all horses for courses. But <coughs> as you can see, there's about one, two, three, four different names. If you look through the literature, there's four different names for the same thing. So <laughs> take your pick. 
Uh, this is another one that's in the literature called NBLTE-M, which means narrowband, long-term evolution, machine type. I'm very confused about this one myself because I actually think this is probably the same as NBIoT. Right, so I won't even bother talking about this. So here's the big one in the cellular industry, NBIoT, narrowband internet of things. Also gets called CAT NB1. Also gets called CAT M2. <coughs> um, so this actually, uh, the, the standard for this was released only in March 2016, only like nine months ago. So it shows you how new all this stuff is. Now, having myself having been a, a rep at, uh, for the CSIRO rep for uh, Wi-Fi, I know that before the standards actually get uh, released or ratified, that the companies are trailing along like only about a millimetre behind the standard doing um, chipsets or, let's say, pre-release chipsets. So there's been various companies that have been uh, trailing along behind NBIoT, uh, like U blocks, and there's one over in China called CAC, and there's a, I've got a whole list of them in another later slide, who have been following along behind this, just waiting for the um, cellular operators to actually roll it out, and they're, 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 so that their products will then get used. Um, so this this is only like uh, 200 kilohertz bandwidth uh, in the frequency spectrum, and that uh, equates to 200 kilobits per second. Uh, and it, yeah, so it's a lot lower data rate than what you talk about for uh, your 4G phone, uh, and that's because it's a narrowband network. Um, you, can, you guys can have a look at that when you, if, if ever you get all of these slides. Anyway, there's too much detail there. So here's a bit of a comparison of um, the, the cellular standards. So Cat 4 is probably your mo is a mobile phone kind of thing. And currently we're talking about, um, you know, it's the 4G mobile phone stuff can go up to, I think it's a gigabit per second or something like that with the, if you're standing right underneath the base station and you're, you're holding your nose the right way or something like that. Um, it never act, in the real world, it never actually gets up to those data rates. Um, so then there's uh, another one called Cat1. It's about 10 megabits per second. Then there's CAT M1, which is the first of the uh, narrowband um, IoT ones, and that's up to about one megabits per second. We talked about that earlier on. They call it LTE-M or LTE-MTC or LTE CAT M1 or something. And then there's NBIoT, which is tens of kilobits per second in 200 kilohertz. Right, and that's, that's the big buzzword that everybody seems to be talking about uh, in the cellular industry. And here's where you kind of use, th these are the different usage scenarios for each of these. And so, uh, you know, light sensors or whatever um, are down here using the NB, NBIoT or CAT NB1. And then wearables or whatever kind of up here you know, you can have a look at that in more detail later on. And a lot of these things are talked about as a usage or the usage scenarios in the, in the other presentations. 5G, who knows what that is? I don't, I don't know what it is yet. They're saying it's going to be coming out in 2020, but there'll be provisions for, uh, uh, there'll be hooks in there for, NBI, for uh, IoT anyway. <coughs> so the trick is how do you choose which one to use? You probably can't even read that, but here's, a, here's an example of a um, selection table for various different types of LB, LP, WAN technologies. And uh, you know, you might, you've got categories like the frequencies that you use, um, the range, uh, the node bandwidth, uh, battery life, uh, security, all these kind of things. They're so all selection criteria for using it. And so you, the user, have got to come to a decision based on what things are most important for you. So there's no one answer to any of this kind of stuff. 
<coughs> so I'll, I'll just break it down into some big categories, right? First off, readiness for market. Is NBIOT ready for market yet? I don't think so. I, I was at uh, Australian Utilities Week two weeks ago. I went up to the Telstra stand and I said, when is this stuff coming out? And he said, the uh, rep said, um, oh, it's going to be, I was told 2016 Q4. And I said, well, that's now. He said, well, okay, how about I say 2017 Q1? <laughs> so, <laughs> who knows? Uh, and then Dean, uh, Dean this morning said uh, 2017 Q4. So, and he's been told by his people inside Telstra so who really knows? I don't know. You know, it's supposed to be just a um, a base station upgrade. And actually, interesting anecdote. Um, I'm one of my clients is looking at rolling is uh, looking at. I'm consulting for him to roll out or to respond to a tender for a big city council. And uh, he was talking to a big carrier to try and partner with him, or his company. And uh, he, the big carrier came back and said we don't have 4G base stations in your target area, so therefore we can't, we can't tell you when we're going to put NBIOT in there. Right? And so basically that just locked out that carrier from his bid. Right? And because, they didn't, because 4G base stations aren't everywhere, which is something that I was even surprised at. So as to whether NBIOT is ready or not, I don't, I don't think so. Not yet, anyway. But a lot of people are hanging back on it because it will be ubiquitous. So the question is, do you need something to be ubiquitous or are you happy just to have something covering a well-defined local area? Right? Um, now, on the other hand, is it a well-respected standard? You know, like, so some of the proprietary ones, some, some of the prospective users may never have ever heard of them, but they've all heard of of 3G and 4G, and you just say, NBIOT is just part of 4G. <coughs> and they say, oh, well, you've got Optus and Vodafone and um, Telstra out there. Uh, we, you know, they're, they're delivering a pretty good service, so uh, you know, we trust them. But then, are you prepared to pay a SIM charge? Or if you get, are you going to have a SIM charge... How does a SIM charge compare to operating your own network and having to do all of your own service level agreements on your own network? So that's a question that um, any tender or any operator's got to, got to think about, like a, a city council. And I am seeing that city councils are probably the first adopters on most of this stuff. They seem to be the ones who are going in, um, going into it first up. <coughs> the other thing is, is it fit for purpose and like, do you, have, you got, have you got power available or do you have to operate on battery? How long do the batteries have to last? Is it economic if the batteries have to be replaced every one year? Or must they be replaced uh, every 10 years to make it economic? And I've gone through some business studies on that, uh, or case, business cases on that for, um, say, for example, for Sydney Water or something like that, where actually it's cheaper for them to send a guy around reading the metres than it is to pay the money to uh, put in a smart meter. So something, mm, this is all a little bit, um, not quite fully defined yet, it's very nascent, this whole thing. It's only just starting up. So uh, it's, not, it's not, the more I get into this, the more I realise how it's not quite there yet. Um, and also the, the other thing to consider is the ecosystem. Uh, base stations, what's called gateways in IoT, that's in parlance. Um, nodes and sensors, right? Uh, can you get the nodes and sensors for that particular technology? And can you get a platform which will support um, the end user? And there's lots of each of those around. So, um, so I'll just go run you through some of the hardware that's around at the moment. Sigfox, uh, basically there are their operator is a franchise, so you have to use uh, the uh, Sigfox hardware. All the franchisees use the Sigfox hardware for the gateways. It's quite difficult actually to find out the technical specs for Sigfox. I've found anyway, or I have not found. Um, LoRaWAN is much more open source, and so there's uh, quite a few different suppliers 
of base stations, and there's a list of them up there. And NBIoT, uh, like the chipsets are not even out, but um, there's a company called Ublox, which is one of the chipset providers, and they, they've got an office in Chatswood, and they're saying that their chips are going to be released right about now, actually. And um, I'm talking to another client about uh, whether we, we might end up doing something with their chipsets. Um, CPUs, there's a lot of like hobbyist CPUs around that you can use, like um, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis or whatever, and they have um, slots in them. There you can you can drop in um, RF modules into the slots, and these things are very cheap. So uh, I go to a few of these um, user groups around the place, and they um, you've got the guys around sitting around eating pizzas and drinking cokes, um, uh, putting these things together and then writing the, the firmware or the software for it and then producing little nodes themselves. So it's kind of like almost like a hobbyist kind of thing. Um, it kind of reminds me of Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, you know, kind of at the beginning of Microsoft, you know, the kind of geeky kind of guys. Well, that's, that's happening right now with IoT and who knows, they could be the next Microsoft, those kind of guys, I don't know. Um, there's lots of different sensors around and there's RF modules around. So there's a list of a whole lot of those, and these just plug into those uh, those CPU modules. Actually, one of these one of the CPU modules. So these are these Arduino is quite power hungry, so it's not really appropriate or not very good for a, a battery powered node, I'm told. But this this one here is from uh, Semtech, I think, and they have a special low power uh, processor. So basically, you can take one of those, put in an RF module, and you've got a low power, um, low power L LPWAN node. Here's a bit of a collection of different types of sensors around: water meters, electricity meters, gas meters, parking sensors. Who's who's visited Lane Cove Car Park over the Lane Cove Council Car Park over the last two years? You've seen the, the little parking sensors there? Yeah? Little, that's these little things. These things are, every one of the car parking spots has got that. I don't know whether it uses Wi-Fi or what, but uh, um, y you can also have uh, kind of like add-on um, hardware. Like for example, uh, water meters or whatever have little, um, what they call pulse closures on them. And so you can, have a, you can buy a little, um, Little devices which will measure the pul which will log the pulse closures, and that'll be for all of those different types of wireless technologies as well. So I just put that up as a bit of a pick list, and the platforms is the other thing that's a big thing that's got to be considered. And there are um, quite a few companies around doing platforms. In fact, there's way too many of them, and I'm sure this is all going to because the industry is so nascent. There's a, there's so many. There's a lot of these around. And I'm sure they're all going to get swallowed up by somebody or other until there's only a couple of big ones left. But if you're a startup, and there's actually is one of the startup companies is here today, is uh, called Skygrid. They're doing their own platform, and they've got a little stall over there. I've met those guys a few times, and uh, you know who knows their business plan might to be to get bought out by somebody big. But uh, this is all happening. Um, and I read a really interesting article the other day about who, who's going to make money out of IoT. And because this is the question I'm asking is, is, is anybody actually making money out of this yet? There are. OK, well, congratulations. You're the only one. I don't know. Um, but uh, what I got told, or what, what this article said was it thought that the big winners are going to be the integrators. Because there, because it takes a lot of knowledge and intelligence to be able to hook together all the different components. <coughs> uh, so I'll go through a couple of network rollouts. So Thinkstra is rolling out over Australia and New Zealand. They say that they've got right now they've got 63% of the Australian population covered, 80% of New Zealand. They say by end of next year they'll have 95% um, of ANZ covered. And then co. It, yep. Okay. All right. So I won't go. I've got to skip through a few. So I'll just finish off by just showing you through a couple of case studies, right? 
One of them is uh, GWM Water up at, um, that's down in Victoria. And they've, they, they've done, that's all of their uh, business case here. They kind of went to a lot of trouble to, to, to do that. They've got the standard kind of uh, topology. That's their equipment there. They've got 46 base stations installed. They're covering a big pipeline. And they're using Taggle's equipment, actually, Australian-made provider's equipment. Uh, there's some of the pictures of their equipment there, water meters. And that's their platform there. And there's another company over in um, West Australia called OVAS. And they're doing uh, measuring kind of uh, agricultural, you know, soil, soil moisture and things like that. Uh, they're using um, equipment from LX Group, which is based in Sydney. Right, uh, over at Australian Technology Park. So that, that's their business case. If any of you want the slides, just come and see me and I'll give them to you. Uh, that's a picture of their equipment with a nice country scene in the background. There's the, that's their node, that's their soil sensor there. And that's their platform which they developed themselves. Okay, there's a whole lot of, um, if you want to get into this industry, if you want to, find, there's a whole lot of groups around, meetup groups. Um, there's uh, also a newsletter by uh, Stuart Corner. Is, he was here before. Um, okay, and all right, here's a, here's a roll up. It's, this is all really cool, all this kind of stuff. LP WANs are going to be what makes this really big. We're really early days now, still. And uh, there's lots of different players and standards. We don't know who's going to win. Um, horses for courses, you've got to figure out what your usage scenario is and then choose according to that. And I just think of it as like a gigantic wave is coming, right? It's going to be a huge wave. If you start paddling too early, you're going to get exhausted before the wave arrives. If you don't, if you don't paddle early enough, the wave's going to, kind of, going to come by and you're going to bob up and you're going to bob down and you're going to see the wave going that way. Um, so. I just suggest that uh, if you think there's something in this, start paddling now, but keep an eye on that wave coming behind you. Okay, uh, we've got enough time for questions or shall we move on? Okay, we've got to move on. So if anybody wants to get the slides or actually ask me some questions, come up and talk to me later on. Thank you very much.